Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. God has blessed America, and yet we are a country divided by ideologies, politics, sin, and a host of issues that appear to divide us more than they unite us. How is a pastor to encourage his flock during such challenging times? He preaches strong messages focused on the realities of history and the human condition that have existed in every generation recorded in the Bible and how God wants us to respond. Our next guest compiled seven such sermons and bound them together for our edification, instruction, correction, and to remind us of the great blessings God has bestowed upon us and how we are to navigate a life that honors God even during tumultuous times. Alan Jackson is, a pa is passionate about helping people become more fully devoted followers of Messiah who respond to God's invitations for their life. He served World Outreach Church since 1981, becoming senior pastor in 1989. With degrees from Oral Roberts University and Vanderbilt, and additional studies at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and Hebrew University of Jerusalem, he's uniquely equipped to help people develop a love and understanding of God's Word. Joining us now to talk about his new book, God Bless America Again, is Pastor Alan Jackson. Alan, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you, Eric. It's good to be with you today. Uh, what, a, what a great time to kind of uh, bundle this message that says that uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Mm -hmm. And we are right in the midst of it. But yet God, in our 240 plus years, has incredibly blessed America and continues to bless America. And that as much as the griping and complaining that goes on about it, it really is a count your blessings kind of message that uh, keeps our eye on the prize and why we should walk in those blessings. Take us on a little journey back in time as we were getting ready for the show. You shared with me that uh, there was a point in time that you were a, uh, in a microbiology lab during the day and breaking horses at night right here in Birmingham, Alabama. So take us back to the early years that uh, what makes Alan Jackson, Alan Jackson and your journey to faith. All right, I can do that. My father was a veterinarian. Uh, he had an equine practice. He only treated horses, and I live in Tennessee now, but we really started the journey in South Florida. He was working on the thoroughbred tracks down there and then brought the family here when I was a boy because the pace of life was a little different, and the Tennessee walking horses were here. So I grew up in horse barns and racetracks and cleaned a lot of stalls and hauled a lot of hay. And I, I really honestly fell in love with medicine. I liked the challenge of medicine and the problem-solving of it and the dynamics of it. But by the time I got to college age, I was tired of veterinary medicine. I thought I was going to go to was going to study. I might as well go to medical school. The compensation was better, and I could have horses as a hobby. So I was working my way through that, and I heard myself saying that God was the most important thing in my life, but I was building my whole life structure around being independent, both academically and financially. And the more I said it, the more uncomfortable I became with that that dichotomy. But you know, this was 40 years ago, and I grew up in the Methodist Church, and ministers wore long black robes and smiled on holidays, and I couldn't see, imagine, I couldn't imagine a way where I could serve the Lord that fit with a, my, who I was, and so that's how I got to Birmingham. I had a fellowship in a microbiology lab through a client of my dad's, and so I worked in the day, daytime in the micro lab, and then at night, the bargain was I'd break horses for him in order to get the fellowship. So I spent a summer in Birmingham. You have mosquitoes that should file flight plans. And then, uh, but before I got done with my undergraduate degree, I withdrew my applications from med school and told the Lord I'd do whatever he wanted. And I really had no imagination I'd end up in the pastorate, but I wanted to help people get to know God. There's a bit of the backstory that's probably worth telling. We were Methodist, but we weren't Christians. You know, you can go to church and not be a Christian. It didn't matter the label. And my mom was diagnosed with cancer when she gave birth to my youngest brother and told she had six months to live. And my parents are flying to Mayo Clinic. And she said a prayer that if there was a God that before she died, she could know the truth so she could tell her sons to be Jewish or Baptist or Catholic, whatever that might be. 
And when they finished the, the workup at Mayo Clinic, all the tumors that were in the x-ray films from the University of Missouri were gone. And the doctor came in the room late at night and said, you're one of those fortunate people that we occasionally see. We can't find your cancer. Go home and raise your babies. And 10 weeks later, we're in Miami Beach, and my dad's starting a new practice. And she heard a voice come. She was washing dishes, and the voice said, you said you want to know the truth. And she said, yes, I did. And he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And she went and found her Bible and looked it up in John 14. And so that's really how our journey began. Our, we, we came to faith outside the church. My parents had a Bible study in their home for 12 years that was really kind of people that fell through the cracks of organized religion. So most of my spiritual formation took at place outside of a formal religious setting. And the church today is, it's the word that's used in the Bible, but it's really a place for broken people to come and find hope and restoration and meaning and purpose in their lives through the person of Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting that, that uh, medicine, the entire science world, um, finds its power, its dominion, and its authority when something has a name. So if I can diagnose it, I can treat it. But if I can't name it, then I have to go through this whole process of trying to identify, rule out, until I can find a name. And if I can name it, I can have dominion over it. And you know, it's interesting that God brought everything to Adam to name, and everything that he named, he gave him dominion over. And the only thing that God did not bring him to name was himself. Mm -hmm. And it clearly established right in the beginning, we don't have dominion over God. God has dominion over us. And so as educated as we want to be and as knowledgeable and as all the names that we want to learn and all the science we want to learn, we still, he's the creator, we are the creation. And that reverent awe, that fear, that, that knowledge is <clears throat> awe-inspiring because the scientific world is fascinating. The medical world's fascinating. Working with animals, especially horses, they're really fascinating. They're brilliant animals and they're amazing creatures and they're huge. But yet, you blow on their nose, you look in their eyes, you build a relationship and we share so much of the same genetic structure that there should be some symbiotic relationship, some compatible relationship, because we share about, what, 94, 95, maybe even 96 percent of our DNA structure is the same as anything that's made up of carbon, that's made up of all the same building blocks of life, the dirt of the ground. And so it's really quite extraordinary that if we can find unity with an animal, why we can't seem to find unity with our own kind, man. Well, I love the point that, you know, there's really no discrepancy between faith and science. Uh, God can withstand the prying of our towering intellect, I promise you. And it's true, God let us name the animals, but God reserved for himself the, the right to name the stars. You know, it says he calls each star by name and he didn't invest that authority in us. I think it's a reminder that we are creatures of this planet, that we are made from the dust, and there are limits to what we can do. And God reminds us of those limits in so many ways. But I, I love the notion, because my academic career began in the sciences. You know, the Bible begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you'll accept that premise as God is the creator, the designer, and the sustainer, the Bible makes sense. If you reject that principle in the first chapter of the Bible, the rest of the book is nonsense. And so I think we have to grapple with that and decide what we're going to believe. And I agree with you completely. You know, it was the history of science, doing, studying the history of science in, an academic, in a university setting that really gave me the courage and my faith to decide to serve the Lord fully. Because I realized that the most brilliant scientist in every generation, if you scroll forward a couple hundred years, the third graders would laugh at them. You know, it wasn't so long ago that physicians didn't wash their hands between patients, not trying to be sloppy. They didn't have any idea of the germ theory. And so th there was a generation where the most brilliant people on the planet thought the world was flat. 
you know, science is a process. It's not the end all, the repository of all knowledge. That's God. And if we make science a God, we've created an idol that will disappoint us. So I don't ever want people of faith to apologize because they believe in science and they believe in God. The Bible is not intended to be a science book nor a history book. And if you try to make it such, you create some complications and contradictions that are difficult. But if you'll accept the premises that are put out, you know, every scientific theory starts with a set of facts that are put forward and then have to be proven and established. And that's exactly what the Bible does. And then we're invited to live it out by faith, take that little mustard seed of faith that you and I were talking about, and begin to put it into play in our lives. And as you do that, the concept, the theory of God grows into a reality that you'll bet your eternity on. And so it's a wonderful principle. Don't ever apologize to the people of faith because you believe your Bible and you believe in science. The two are completely compatible. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> the, the understanding of RNA and DNA, the understanding of uh, quantum physics and quantum science uh, takes us on a journey in a quantum faith. And when we run those parallels, we find out that science gives us a pathway to really probe deeper, broader, wider than we ever thought possible into the supernatural. Because we now have the ability to grasp concepts we cannot see. I, I cannot see uh, gravity. I can't see certain things. So there's a certain amount of faith that's so inherent to science that when you break it down and say, well, wait a second, you've got these equations, and these are equations all about things you cannot see. Inertia. You can't see inertia. You can measure. You have wonderful sayings, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Well, uh, if you're not growing, you're dying. It's great parallels between it. So well, God you, created us with five senses, and they're wonderful gifts, but they're limited. And I think we all understand that. We understand that our, our hearing has limits, that even other animals, you know, dogs have hearing capabilities that we don't have. And if you imagine that the world is limited to what your five senses are, you, you live in a very narrow circle, a rather naive circle. Right. And then what the Bible invites us to believe is that the spiritual realm is as real as the realm that we can contact with our five senses. And if you'll open your heart to that, it changes how we live in time because it invites us into the awareness of eternity. And it sets us free from the tyranny of time and gives us a hope and a purpose for our lives and an awareness that there's a power greater than ourselves which will help bring us out of the failure of that original garden where we want to be like God. And it, it gives us the invitation to believe that there is a God and that we can serve him and gain the benefits that come from his wisdom and his insight and his understanding that exceeds what we have in our physical capacity. It's an exciting invitation to be people of faith. It is. It is. Uh, there's, there's so many parts about uh, the scriptures that open up true avenues of incredible things. Uh, you think about the uh, opening line of, in Genesis 11 as God is evaluating what they're doing at Babel, and he makes this incredible statement. He said, if these people do this in one accord, nothing will be impossible for them. You know, God never retracted that statement. You're right. God never said, if man were to do in one accord anything, nothing would be impossible for them. Jesus even threw it down even further. He said, all this you've seen, all this you've heard, you'll do even greater than this. How can I conceive of that? I have to look at what God says. If I do this in one accord, one accord with God, uh, with the Holy Spirit, in uh, complete harmony with the Word of God, then I am in one accord with the creator of the universe. Why would I not be able to do greater things? He says, nothing will be impossible for me. And he's never withdrawn that statement. He confused right. us by language, but he didn't take away 
that statement, and that statement motivates me. That statement en enrages me to and impassions me to want to do more in unity, to find ways to bring the body together so that we can accomplish more and greater than what we are accomplishing. Absolutely. You know, in John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer, where he prayed that we would be one. It, it isn't just our union with the Father. We've got to learn to walk in unity with one another. And if there's a failure that I think we have within Christendom, it's the divisiveness, you know, and the, the, the pride and the self-righteousness and the selfish ambition that separates us and keeps us from being willing to help one another and to cooperate and to truly celebrate one another's victories. Because in that division and in that pride, we forfeit so much of what we can be. We recreate our own Tower of Babel and forfeit um, what God called us to. I think it's one of the messages in, in Acts 2 on Pentecost when God gave them that heavenly language. And it, it began, it really is when the church broke up in a whole new way. I mean, the city of Jerusalem stirred by the person of Jesus in a way that they weren't stirred when Jesus was there. And so I think you're absolutely right with that Genesis 11 comparison. And there's so much potential if we can learn to respect one another and honor one another and stop quibbling about which translation we read or the color of the grape juice with which I receive communion or which style of worship I prefer or what the clothing of the presenter at the front of the room looks like. You know, we have settled on tertiary issues and have failed to stand together. Patrick Henry, you know, the, the, the American patriot, has a line that I think works for the church today. He said, we'll either hang together or we will hang separately. And I think we're facing that conundrum once again. Well, we are. We are uh, the only army in the world that shoots their wounded. Mm. We have set up across the world within subdivisions, 38,000 denominations. So many ways to slice it so thin. And I came out of the synagogue. So 44 years in the synagogue before I came to faith in Jesus, 25 years ago. And I thought that this was the most unifying thing. If this was, if, if faith in Jesus was the most important thing in Christianity, then, then I knew the compounding of one. I knew it from the Hebrew. I knew how one plus one equaled one, but it was a greater one. For this reason, a man should leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one. That one is two united as one. Ephesians 2, from the two he shall make one, one new man. That compounding of one was so incredibly powerful. The compound unity of the Godhead, whether or not you call it triune, whether or not you call it compound, however you refer to it in the Hebrew, it's a compound unity. It be as many parts as you want it to be, but it's one, one God, all-powerful, all-knowing, every aspect, all contained in that one. So your light and my light aren't two lights, they're one greater light. And when Jesus said, let your light so shine, I thought, wow, I could join together with two and a half billion lights, that's two and a half billion candle power, that would give a beam emanating from the earth to the heaven that could be seen from every corner of the world. Would people be drawn to that like a moth to the flame? I want to be a part of that, a part that unifies and found that I didn't find that unity. Hmm. Actually in the process of writing a book called Confused by Christianity, Confessions of a Jewish Believer. It confuses me that the most, the, the most important thing, the one thing we all agree on, is that Jesus died for our sins. And yet we quarrel about all the rest. You know, I think it's, it's a unique malady of people of faith in general. When I was at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, a lot of my friends in the university there hadn't interacted a lot with Christians. Mm -hmm. And in their imagination, a Christian was a Christian was a Christian. So when I say to my friends here that the average Israeli on the street is more comfortable with a Muslim than a Christian, they're perplexed by that. But I also came to understand the diversity within the Jewish community. 
And so when I, you know, and most of my acquaintances here think if you're Jewish, you know, there's there's just one flavor of that or one understanding of that. And so I, I think it's something that perplexes us all. I think we need to recognize that we have an adversary and he wins through division. And the, the, I think the lever he uses is the same lever that got Satan in trouble, is pride. We want something that elevates us, that makes us better than somebody else. And he will use almost anything. He'll make us pride. You know, we'll be proud of the things that are destructive to us. And if we can humble ourselves and realize that what gives us status and standing is our relationship to a person, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth, and that's what gives us access to the kingdom of God, and that I'm not going to do anything to add to that, and I can't do anything to detract from that, that I am, then I am grateful to declare Jesus as Lord of my life and to serve him with a freedom and an abandon and a hope, because whatever good there is in me has come from that relationship with him. You know, I love what Paul, he reminds us of it in several places, but the Corinthians, he hip, kept having to bang them with this, you know, that God recruit. He didn't recruit from the nobility and the wealthy. He recruited from those that weren't so noble and those that weren't so clever. And then he reminds them of their moral failings, that they were involved in all sorts of sexual immorality and stealing and drunkenness. And he said, that's what you were, but you were washed and cleaned and, and justified and sanctified. And it's, it's God that has done this work in us. We have not done it to ourselves. You know, when I was a new believer, I thought God had gotten a bargain when he recruited me for the kingdom and we'd go make a difference. And the, the more I continue to grow up in my faith, the more I understand God took on a tremendous liability when he welcomed me into the kingdom. And that we do need one another. And that we may, you know, our, our form of worship may different, be different and our personal preferences around worship may be different. But what binds us together is the same. Jesus is still the head of the church. And I think the season that is in front of us, we're going to have to know that or we will not be able to maintain our freedoms and accomplish what God has called us to. But it's not a new struggle. In the book of Acts, the believers were struggling with that. They had to keep coming back to Jerusalem. And, you know, even Peter, when he goes to, to Caesarea under the divine initiative of a vision and the Cornelius' a servant's calling, there's clear concern. What, what am I going to say when I go back to Jerusalem? And if you follow his report back, he makes it very clear that it was all supernatural. You know, I had a vision and it was repeated three times and Cornelius saw an angel. And, you know, the, Peter's like saying, I had nothing to do with this because there's, there was enough division in the church in its early months and those early years that we, and it, so it doesn't surprise me that two millennia later, we are separated and sliced so thinly that it's embarrassing. And if we can acknowledge it and humble ourselves, I believe the Spirit of God is bringing unity. You know, I serve an interdenominational congregation. There's about 60 different Christian traditions represented on a typical weekend. And we sit peacefully together or stand peacefully together and serve the Lord. That's a miracle. And I believe we will see those things increase as we move forward towards the end of this age. It's, a, uh, <clears throat> it's an amazing picture prophetically of what God is trying to do in this season of getting our attention. Mm. And I think that the, uh, the watchword of Corona has been set apart. And if we look at what's happened in these last nine months, eight months, God has set us apart. He's put us back in our homes. He reminds us that when Jesus was asked what are the two greatest commandments, the first one he said was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. But to the Jewish mind, you finish Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9. And that's just the start. It's just the beginning. That's how you teach Scripture in the synagogue. Is you give me the first four or five words, I give you the rest of the contextual passage. And the rest of the contextual passage is... Um, and these commands I give you today are to be on your heart and you're to teach them to your children and talk about them when you lie down and when you rise up and when you walk along the way. And then you say, the way? Oh, that, that, that's Jesus. He's the way, the truth. And, and all of a sudden it's all driven back to the home. And guess what? We've all been driven back home. Mm -hmm. time Absolutely. To go, time to be set apart. Right, now, who's going to emerge from this 
with the Word of God on their lips and bringing devotionals into the home and seeing mom and dad pray for the first time and stop being the, I go to church on Sunday, but I don't do anything about it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's the big cry of the millennials is why should I go when I've never seen mom and dad on during the week ever open a Bible? I've never seen them do, I've never heard them pray. So I, they look so good and they look so righteous, and I mean they get all dressed up and they, they everything's so perfect, and they had had to drop me off at my class, and and uh, uh, maybe in the car on the way to lunch they asked me what did we learn, but I don't ever remember the kid asking the mom and dad, well what did you learn? That was the time to impart and to connect, and then keep that alive. Mm -hmm. Well, now you don't have a choice. Yeah, 2020 is, I think we'll look back at this as a transition year. And I, we're, we had the discussion here that we're planting a new church. This is our 40th anniversary, but I really think we're planting a new congregation. And I agree with you. God sent us home. You know, it says in Hebrews, that once again, I'll shake the earth so that everything that can be shaken can be, will be shaken. And it'll reveal the unshakable kingdom of God. And I think we're watching that. The things in our faith that could be shaken have been shaken to their foundation. And But out of this, there's coming, I believe, a new generation of faith, people that are hungry, that rep recognize the significance of, of who we are and what we are. And I also think we recognize some new adversaries more clearly, fear and confusion, a deception. I don't think we've ever seen them break into the open quite this clearly, where we have to grapple with them. I never imagined in fact, I would have made a wager with you that there was nothing they could do that would cause us to close our church. If a tornado had hit our building, we'd have pulled up a hay wagon and we'd have had church in the midst of the rubble. And for 10 weeks, we were closed and we're doing live stream church. And then we said, we've had, we've had church outside now for 30 weeks because we needed a way that public officials didn't have the leverage to say it was destructive for our community. I would have, and we're, we're learning that the privilege of being together is more valuable than our comfort and our convenience. And we had lost that idea. We had somehow managed to exchange the notion of a relationship with God for an appointment on the weekend for a few minutes in a specific building. And I believe God is awakening us once again. We've been asleep. You know, sleep is a normal part of your life routine. But when you're asleep, you're unaware, you're uninvolved, and you're unconcerned. It's not wrong, you're asleep. And I think the, we had largely been asleep for too long. And God is awakening us because he needs us desperately to be salt and light in this season. There are things that have been happening on our watch, and we were disengaged with them. And he needs the church to be the voice for truth that he's called us to be. And that's going to take a courage and a boldness and a willingness to stand in this season, uh, unlike anything I think we've seen in my lifetime. It's an exciting time. I didn't get to ride with Paul Revere through the streets of Boston, but God called me to the 21st century to be an advocate for Jesus of Nazareth in the face of a tremendous transition in the earth. And that's an honor and a privilege for every one of us who are Christ followers. Amen. Amen. We've been talking to Alan Jackson, author of a bound transcript of sermons in book form entitled God Bless America Again, A Prophetic Perspective. What is God saying in this season? What would God say to you in this season? I know what you've said to him. You've said, Lord, how do I get out of this? And I know that's the wrong question. Because the question God wants you to ask is, what do you want me to get out of this? Yeah, how, I agree. How you're going to get out of it is going to be a vaccine. But what are you going to get out of it? That's up to you. You can get out of a deeper relationship with your children, a deeper relationship with the Lord, a deeper relationship with the Word of God. Are you going to be a uh, that overcomer that Jesus reserves that place for sitting next to him? You can't be that overcomer if you haven't had a challenge. Mm -hmm. Something like corona or war or whatever lies ahead. Christian persecution on our shores, not possible. Oh, it's coming. But where will you stand? And will you stand? And what will you stand on? 
We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about those very topics because they are at the heart of this new book, God Bless America Again, as a wake-up call and a reminder of what God would be saying to you right now, what God is saying to you right now, if you'll listen. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and my special featured guest twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Perot and Carl Gallops, and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black and Sean Tabbitt for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well now, there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Pastor Alan Jackson, author of the new book, God Bless America Again, a prophetic perspective. It is bound uh, transcripts, in a sermon in book form, and a fascinating read. Alan, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Eric. It's good to be with you today. Alan, what prompted this series and what message was really burning within you that had you combine these seven? Well, it started really as a response. I heard influential people in our nation saying that uh, we weren't really a nation with a Christian heritage, that that had been an imposition upon us, you know, kind of a corruption of our story. And I realized that so many of the people that I serve and do life with didn't have enough background in history to be aware of the story. So I really wanted them to understand that we have a heritage of faith and that I didn't want us to forfeit that and that there was something nefarious in those that wanted to deny it or diminish it or to minimize it because our legal system, our academic model, so many of the things that had really brought strength to our nation from its inception until today had emerged from a Judeo-Christian worldview. And if we diminish that, I think we'll diminish our freedoms and our liberties. So it's important that we understand the heritage that we have so that we can understand the future that we need to preserve. It's interesting how few really understood the impact in the formation of America, the Black Robe Regiment, of what the part the pulpit played mm -hmm. 
in leading the people, encouraging the people, equipping the people, and challenging the people to fight for the freedoms that we so richly enjoy and uh, appreciate. Uh, as a uh, first post-Holocaust generation Jew, I know what it was like for our families to have lost uh, my grandparents coming in 1904, leaving the shtetl in uh, southern Poland, western Ukraine, where life had existed for them for eternity. It was the same way of life and that you see in Fiddle on the Roof, and it was, uh, it was a good life. And there was not conflict between Jew and Gentile. There was, there was a beautiful community relationship. You had various gifts and, and skills. And when they lost that and we were forced out, uh, they were brought to America. And what they found on the shores here was they could be anything and do anything. And yeah, there was prejudice and there was anti-Semitism and there was hatred and there was also the Chinese faced it and the Irish faced it and the Italians faced it and the blacks faced it and you know there's very few people who are what would you consider to be um, true Americans just plain old uh, indigenous the indigenous people of America are the Native American Indians. None of us are indigenous to America. We're all immigrants. We all need to count and take inventory. But when we look at our legal system, it was a non-believer, Yitro, Jethro, sitting with his son-in-law, hearing about the magnificent things that God had done, put his faith in this God that delivered, and then watched as Moses worked himself up all day long listening to the cases and the charges of one person against another, and he said, you know, this isn't a good system. Mm -hmm. What you're doing isn't good. You need to have representatives for tens and hundreds and thousands and let them hear those cases and then you be like the what? The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Oh, okay, so that's how we have our court system in America today. It's straight out of the Bible. It's not right. one jot or tittle different than the Midianite suggested. That's a rich heritage of Judeo-Christian biblical systems that were put in place, which was a doctrine of social justice and fairness. Oh, we had sanctuary cities, but they weren't for the protection of the illegals. They were for the protection of the person that might be wrongfully accused of murder and that they would have a safe place to go to get a fair trial and due process and my goodness, we, it's all part of our Constitution. It is. And you're right, we are a nation of immigrants. And the truth is, most of us fled to this nation because of famine or persecution or a lack of opportunity. And we came here with very little but hope and an idea. And we didn't look the same. We didn't speak with the same accent. We didn't share a common history. The things that typically have bound the nation states together was not our story. We are bound together by an ideal. And I think Jefferson stated it beautifully in the introduction to the Declaration of Independence that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. And that principle that we do have a Creator, that our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness does not come from a government, it comes from Almighty God. And the founders had the wisdom or the anointing or the intervention of God enough to, to create a document that understood we need protection from the government. That the governments have had a history throughout human civilization of consuming those they govern. And they formed documents to protect us from the government. And if we lose sight of the overarching authority of Almighty God and His principles in our lives, 
we will lose our life and our liberty and our pursuit of happiness. And I think in every generation, that's the assignment of the church. You know, in, in Deuteronomy, the instructions given to talk to your children when you're at home, when you walk along the roads, when you lie down at night, to talk about these things with them. Because we have to teach every new generation the principles that are most valuable to us. It only takes three generations for an idea to be lost. You know, once upon a time, I had a black telephone that had a rotary dial on it. The young people that work in my office haven't seen those things except in old movies. They have no imagination of them. Uh, my grandfather and Genghis Khan both used the same form of land transportation, a fast horse. And well, that may have persisted for hundreds and hundreds of years, but most of us today would be hard pressed if we had to saddle a horse and put a halter, a bridle in its mouth. You know, it doesn't take long to lose an idea, and we're facing, I, th I think God has shaken us this year to awaken us. We've got an assignment to help the generations coming behind us learn the values that are essential to us. You know, we need to be awakened, not woke, and we need to be awakened to the biblical principles that define our freedoms and liberties, and we'll have to stand for them and see them enforced. They came to us at great sacrifice. They did not come to us freely or cheaply, and they will not be extended to the generations who follow us unless those of us who say we're Christ followers have the courage to make the sacrifices to see the generations coming behind us learn those same values. And I, I'm grateful for what God has done this year. As, un, as uncomfortable as it's been and as disruptive as it's been, I believe it's the Spirit of God moving in the earth to stir the hearts of His people to remind us of what it is that secures our future. And so I am hopeful and excited about what's next. In spite, it's been a battle, and the length of it is, has been far more challenging than I imagined. You know, in my own life, my emotions and my thought life take far more care these days. You know, when they told us, go home for two weeks and you'll be free, I could buy into that, because for two weeks you can do almost anything. But then it was six weeks, and then it was 60 days, and now we're months and months into this, and the end isn't really visible. And so it, it's not how do we get out of this, it's who is God creating in us? What's he creating in us? What are we becoming? And that's an exciting question. So I'm not disheartened by it all. I, I have a tremendous sense of hope that we're going to come through this season stronger and better prepared for what is in front of us. You know, Jesus again, in his answer, what are the two greatest commandments? The second one is playing out right in front of us. Love your neighbor as yourself. You have a neighbor to the right of you. You have a neighbor to the left of you. You have the neighbor across the street that maybe for years you didn't know, you didn't talk to. But now God's calling us to home, to be the sanctuary, to stir the community, our neighbor, physical neighbor, your actual neighbor, the person that lives next door to you, the one who I now trim her hedges and I now bring her trash can in for her, who is much older, make sure that her dog's taken care of, and the one on the other side that has a, a special needs child that I knew that they lived there, but I didn't know anything about what the needs were. But I make sure that their trash cans pull up because I got enough to do with hauling a child that has special needs in a special cart. And uh, there's a back area here that uh, wasn't tended to, and so I went out and got a tractor, and now I mow it. And all of a sudden, it's loving your neighbor as yourself. And we lost the, we didn't lose the lesson because we learned it in Sunday school, we learned it from the pulpit, but we didn't, <laughs> the Bible is wonderful about telling us what to do, but it doesn't always tell us how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, as a child, you read Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9, write them on the doorpost of your house, so uh, I took a marker and started writing on the house and my mother came to me and said, well, what are you, what are you doing? And my father punished me and I had to take sandpaper and I had to sand all these things. And I said, but I was, I was doing what 
it said, it, no, nope, that's, that's, that's not the way to do it. And we do it with a little box. And uh, well, you know what? I'm a kid. Okay? I think right means right. So, I, you know, so what does love your neighbor as yourself? We're starting to get new understanding of the application of taking care of the needs of the widows and the orphans and those in the communities that we live in that we've actually left the neighborhood to go to church somewhere else, to have fellowship somewhere else. Now we're in the yard. And it's been an interesting season. And it's a time of growth. I agree. You know, it's how we get Jesus, we got Jesus to the parable of the Good Samaritan. He's in the dialogue with someone trying to trap him. And the man is really doing pretty well in the discussion and answers well, but he's convicted by his answer. So the question is, who is my neighbor? You know the story. And then Jesus tells him the Good Samaritan. And so I think we're all learning that, that we're not just neighbors with the people that we like or the people who are like-minded, that we have to love those who oftentimes we probably wouldn't have anything to do with. And I think that's a message for us in this season, not just about our physical neighbors, you know, we have sat in our churches and pointed fingers at people who weren't like us and said, you're the problem. If you weren't so ungodly, if you weren't so wicked, if you weren't so immoral, we wouldn't have these problems. But that's not the story of Scripture as I read it. The judgment of God, the, God's intervention in the lives of his people was not because the Canaanites were wicked or the Philistines were wicked. or the. It was because of the hearts of God's people, his covenant people. And I believe the greatest challenge to the church right now is not the depravity of the wicked. It's the indifference of the faithful. And God is shaking us to understand that we have to change our hearts, that this problem is not about somebody else. It's not looking through the stained glass windows of our church and wagging our fingers at people who we think are wrong. It's about looking in the mirror and say, God, be merciful to me. I have been far from you. I have been captured by the idolatry of my generation. I have been duplicitous in my own thoughts. I have been filled with envy and, and all sorts of destructive things. And you love me enough that you have taken this year to turn my face back to my family and back to my home. And you shut down my favorite distractions, my sports and the things that I watch so that I could invest time in the Word of God. And you've created enough fear and confusion and deception that I have to seek you as the author of truth to even know what truth is. And I happen to think it's a tremendous gift from the Lord. You know, Hebrews 12 tells us not to despise the discipline of the Lord. that He disciplines his true children. And if we're not disciplined, we're illegitimate. Well, I, I, I prefer to see this year as God's discipline in our lives and not an intrusion. I want to come out of this having been trained by it, stronger, with a fresh relationship with the Lord, a new love for the Word of God, a new appreciation for my neighbors, those that I agree with, and those that need to know who I am and what I believe, that I've been too busy to talk to. I think it's a wonderful season. So I'm inclined to lift up my head. I think our redemption is drawing closer. And I think the lesson you mentioned earlier about having to be overcomers, you know, the book of Revelation is written to those who overcome. The seven churches are each one at the beginning told they have to overcome. And at the end of the book of Revelation, the promise is to the one who overcomes. There is nobody in that story that doesn't have to be an overcomer, which presupposes there's going to be problems and interruptions and disappointments and uninvited frustrations. And, and we are going to have to choose to overcome. And so we can, we, I think it's okay to say I'm frustrated or I'm angry or I'm resentful or I didn't anticipate it, duly noted. But now let's move on. Let's not stand there in our disappointment. Let's relinquish it to the, the Lord. We can repent and renounce and, and be released and we can move forward. It's, a, it's an important season for the church. Don't, don't get pulled in. This is not a political problem. This is not a, a problem of a virus. This isn't a a scientific problem. This is an issue that is seated in the hearts of God's people. You know, the problem, the Sodom and Gomorrah weren't destroyed because of the wickedness. They were destroyed because there weren't 10 righteous people. And the destruction of our nation won't come because of the wicked people. It will become because of the failure of the righteous. 
And if we will be awakened to God's purposes and recall our heritage, and it's helpful to me to remember the sacrifices of the generations that have gone before us. Freedom isn't free, and men and women have stood together and made tremendous sacrifices for us to have the freedoms and the abundance that we enjoy today. And the question is, what will our generation hand to those who are coming behind us? And I think we have a tremendous opportunity, and God in his mercy has kind of shaken us awake. You know, some of us wake up easily. You know, we hear a slight noise and we're awake and fully alert. Some of us wake up slowly and we wake up in a grumpy mood. And I think the church wakes up differently. Some of us wake up quickly and some of us wake up slowly and we're a little grumpy about it. We liked our patterns and I knew the seat that I was supposed to sit in in the sanctuary and I knew the parking space I preferred and the time I chose to come. And God has awakened us and we're a little grumpy about it. But if we can shake off our slumber, as the scripture says, and renew our interest in the Word of God, and invite the Spirit of God into our lives afresh, and value one another and the privilege of being together, we will come through this renewed and refreshed and repurposed to serve our Lord. It is the wheat and the tares. Mm -hmm. It is right in front of us. One third have said they're not coming back to church. Well, now I know the terrors. You, you look in the mirror and, you know, you're, you're part of the terrors. Mm. God's preparing us for battle. <clears throat> Amen. And in special forces, you, you ring out, you wash out, you hit the bell, you tap out. The people who are tapping out today, <clears throat> I don't want to go to battle. I had no way before of knowing when I sat in the pews in the 15,000 seat sanctuary as to who was going to be there as my rear guard. Who was going to be there to be my Aaron and my her when my arms grew weary? Today I know. Today I know. And tomorrow I'll know even better. And when we come out of this, the ones that remain standing those are the ones that I will link arms with to go into battle because the battle is coming for the soul of this nation. The battle's here. It's, we're losing ground. 60 million babies' blood is crying out from the ground. If the, ones, if the one couple of ounces of Abel's blood was enough to grab God's attention and they could hear, what about the cries of the 60 million? And so as we prepare ourselves, I think this is an outstanding reminder for every household to grab a hold of the blessings that we have and what we need to do in our own selves to make sure that we don't ever lose sight of them again and take them for granted again. Amen. And for us to say, never again will I take my freedoms, my country, my neighbor, my God, my pastor, those who are faithful to the truth of the Word of God. I will never take them for granted again. Amen. Pastor Alan Jackson, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to put together a wake-up call, a reminder, a journey into the past, which will be a springboard for the future that will prepare me to look through a lens, a prophetic lens, the same way the Bible does, of what was and what is and what is to come. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eric, and I appreciate your voice. You are a strength to our nation, and I'm grateful for what you're doing. Thank you. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you again. Once again, Alan Jackson, God Bless America, a prophetic perspective. If you want to get a copy of the book, visit IgnitingAnation.com. Click on today's program schedule, and you'll see a link right to this book. You can have it in your hands in 48 hours. Alan Jackson, thank you. May God bless all the works of your hand. Thank you, and bless you. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of 
revealing the truth.